250 in your hymnal, 250, there's within my heart a melody, Jesus whispers sweet and low. Let's all stand together as we sing 250, he keeps me singing. On that first, there's within my heart a singing this morning good to see you here does this sound right this doesn't sound right to me is that you got everything where it's supposed to be dean check that for me if you would good to see you in church today and uh looking forward to what the lord has in store for us this morning and i know one thing for sure Je jesus will be here he promised when we gather together there he'll be in the midst and so i know he's here holiday weekend or not amen and uh and i'm glad you're here this morning thank you for being in church let's open in prayer together shall we Heavenly Father, we bow before you in prayer today. We thank you, Lord, that there is within our heart a melody. And Lord, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for so loving us that you give your only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Lord, our prayer this morning would be, if any in the room have never received you as their Savior, that today would be the day of their salvation. And then, Lord, I pray that Christ would be lifted up in our service today. You. He said, if he was lifted up, you draw all men unto him. And we sure want to be drawn closer to him because we were in church today. And so may he be exalted in everything we say, the songs that are sung, uh, all that takes place here in this building this morning. May you be pleased. May Christ be honored. And we'll thank you for it. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you can be seated. Shall I turn back? 
truth there i shall not turn back but i will sing of my redeemer and his wondrous love to me let's turn to 268 together if you would 268 i will sing of my redeemer on that first together i will sing of my redeemer and his wondrous love to me on the cruel of rossi's offers from the curse Set me free, sing a sing of my redeemer, who in his blood he purchased me on the cross. He sealed my pardon, he paid the debt and made me free. I will tell the wondrous story. a few announcements for us now if you listen carefully our schedule today uh, usual we have 5 30 christian growth class we meet in the conference room which is right across from the nursery downstairs and uh, tonight our lesson is going to be on root problems root problems oftentimes in our lives we treat the the fruit of the problem because that's what we see but if we never get down to the root of the problem it'll just keep reappearing over and over again so we're talking about the root problems tonight all right be at our class at 5 30 for the christian growth class and then 6 30 tonight uh we'll meet back here in the auditorium for our evening service and uh, uh lord willing tonight i'm going to preach on despise not prophesyings what does that mean and uh we'll find out tonight okay and uh be back for the service this evening at 6 30 then um um Oh, there's a sign-up sheet downstairs, a couple of them. Uh, one is for the parade that will be in for Arts in the Alley on September 19th. Uh, we'll have a float in that parade. We can have as many walkers along the way as we can. If you don't think you can walk it, you can ride on the trailer. We're going to have some bales of hay and such uh, up there. 
Uh, if you're able to sit down, uh, if you'd like to participate in that, just sign up on the paper and we'll get the details here in the next uh, week or so from the city of Grove City about uh, what time to meet and where we'll gather and all that. So, uh, But if you'd like to be part of that on Saturday morning, September 19th, then you sign up down there for that. And also the international dinner, which is that evening at 530, part of the missions conference, sign up sheet for that as well. Uh, that's always a great time, and Saturday night's one of the great nights. Uh, every night's good, but Saturday night's really good, and uh, the missions conference, and uh, we'll have a great time together, so uh, make sure you sign up for that as well down on the table. All right, uh, those of you who have the cards out and the gifts, you uh, try and get those in today if possible, and if not, just let uh, the ladies back there after service know when you'll have that in. If you run into difficulty and you haven't been able to get what you picked up, that's fine, and you don't think you can, maybe you thought you could do something and then you weren't able to, just turn those cards back in, and uh, that's okay. No, uh, Nobody's going to uh, condemn you or scathe you or anything, just uh, those things happen. Uh, but we'd like to be able to get all the cards accounted for and get your items that you have purchased back in if you would, and we can begin to get those prepared for giving them out on the 19th. All right? Now, let's take just a moment, and we'll welcome our guests that came to visit with us today. We're always pleased when folks visit with us in the services, especially on a holiday weekend, and uh, we're delighted to have some guests with us today. Uh, Leanne has a couple guests right over here that uh, she's going to introduce for us this morning. Okay. Chris. All right, that's good. And this is her mother. Mm -hmm. That's great. Good to have both you ladies here today. Uh, Chris's mother, Sandy, just moved here from uh, out in the New Baltimore area, I believe, is where she was, and so she's moved over here now, and uh, she went to New Beginnings Baptist Church out there, which is a church that supports the Moorlands, and uh, so they, they, that's how that connection is, and I met their pastor. He was at the conference that Brother Moreland had, Brother Fennel, and uh, it's good to have you this morning, ladies. Thank you so much for being here. Good to have Johnny Anderson back there. Good to see him this morning, and Anthony from California. Good to have you guys in. They were at the service yesterday for Donald, and uh, it's good to have them in church this morning. Thank you for coming, guys. I appreciate that. And uh, Mary Lou, good to see you here today, too. Glad you're doing better. That's great. All right. Anybody else here this morning we recognize? Terry, you have a guest with you? Sure. Oh, wow. Wonderful. Well, great. Good to have you this morning. Thank you for coming. That's delighted to meet you. Great. All right. Very good. And uh, if you'll take just a moment and fill out the card you were handed by the usher, uh, we would appreciate that. We'd like to have a record of your visit with us this morning. A little bit when we have the offering plate go by, just simply put that card in the plate if you would. And keep the pen as our gift to you for coming today. We're glad you're here. Let's give them all a warm welcome, shall we? Thank you. 
411 in your hymnal 411 I have a message from the Lord hallelujah the message unto you I'll give 411 we're going to sing that first second and last together on that first I have a message from the Lord hallelujah the message unto you I'll give it is recorded in his word hallelujah it is only that you look and live A message full of love, hallelujah, a message, oh my friend, for you, is a message from above, hallelujah, Jesus said it and I know it's true, look and live, my brother, live, look to Jesus now and live, is recorded in his word, hallelujah. As we sing that last, let's have the children dismissed for junior church. On that last together, I will tell you how I came, hallelujah, to Jesus when he made me whole. T'was believing on his name, hallelujah, I trusted and he saved my soul. Look and live, my brother, live. you look and live. Amen. Great singing this morning. 507, 507. Come thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Let's, as you find that, let's stand together one more time. On that first all together. Come thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to Dreams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious song that sung by flaming chords above. Praise the mount, mount of thy redeeming love. Amen. Great one another. Make somebody feel welcome, especially our guests. We'll come back and sing the last stanza together.
Here I raise my Ebenezer, hither by thy help I come, and I hope by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home. Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the fold of God, he to rescue me from danger, interposed his precious blood. On that last altogether O to grace, how great a debtor. Daily I'm constrained to be. Let's live our life like that. Realize that we are truly a debtor. On that last together. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor. Daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, oh, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. All right. You may be seated. Ushers are getting ready, and they'll take our offering this morning. And uh, let's be prepared to give as God has blessed and prospered us. And let's um, guess who filled out the card. If you would put, place that welcome card in the offering as it goes by. We appreciate you doing that. And uh, we'll pray and we'll ask God's blessing on our giving today. Brother Abrams, lead us in our prayer this morning, please. Lord and Heavenly Father, I ask that you bless this offering. Use it, multiply it to your good. Lord, bless our pastor as he brings the message, and we thank you for your word, the Bible, Lord, that uh, transcends date and time. We love you, Lord, and we thank you for another day to worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. Take your Bible, if you would, this morning for our scripture reading. <clears throat> the book of Ephesians, please. Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. We're going to read the first six verses of Ephesians chapter 1. I'm going to begin on verse 1, then you join me on verse 2, then we'll read 3 together, and we'll end together on verse number 6. And as our custom is, let's stand together to read the scripture. All of us standing to read God's word, and I'll begin on verse number one. <clears throat> Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus, and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace be to you, and peace from God our Father, and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, 
having predestinated us under the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. And let's pray together, shall we? Father, we bow before you in prayer now this morning. We thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you, Father, for allowing us to have copies of the Bible with us this morning. Lord, we don't believe it just to be the words of men or the words of a man. We do believe it to be the words of God. And I pray that you would prepare our hearts and make us ready to receive your word today. And so, Lord, bless us special to that end. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. My father is rich in houses and lands. He holdeth the wealth of the world in his hands of rubies and diamonds, of silver and gold. His coffers are full, he has riches untold. I'm a child of the King, a child of the King, with Jesus my Savior. I'm a child of the King. I once was an outcast, stranger on earth, a sinner by choice and an alien by birth. But I've been adopted, my name's written down, and heir to a man shone a robe and a crown. I'm a child of the King, a child of the King, with Jesus my Savior. I'm a child of the King. A tent or a cottage, why should I care? They're building a palace for me over there. No exiled from home, yet still I may sing. All glory to God, I'm a child of the King. I'm a child of the King, a child of the King, with Jesus my Savior. I'm a child of the King. Our Father, we bow before you now in prayer, and we thank you, Lord, for the wonderful truth that we're children of the King by faith in Jesus Christ. Lord, we want to bow this morning before we begin the message to tell you that we love you. We're glad that we're part of the family of God. Lord, my prayer this morning would be if any are in this room and they don't know what that means, they don't understand how they can be part of the family of God, that they would understand that this morning. And that those of us who are part of the family of God would understand our identity in Christ and who we really are. So Lord, help me today to get across this truth and, and open the understanding of the people as they listen. And Holy Spirit, do what only you can do in our midst today. And may we walk out in a little bit saying, all glory to God, I'm a child of the King. Lord, use the message today in the hearts of your people. In Christ's name, amen. amen. You know, um, how many of you have ever been involved or, or, or looked at some of the uh, uh, 
uh, sweepstakes, the uh, publisher clearinghouse, such, you know, where they knock on your door and they got a big check for a million dollars and, and the people say, oh, wow, I can't believe it. You ever, you ever seen those things? How many of you believe that could happen to you? That's what I thought. <laughs> and, uh, and I'm not even sure that's even real, what I'm seeing. There might be a bunch of actors doing that. I don't know. But uh, that's, the, the truth is, most of us don't ever see that happening to any of us. But here, I'm going to share something with you. What is true materially is also true spiritually. There's, there's very few people, as you read through the Bible, you'll see God's blessing on different men and women in the Bible, God doing miraculous things, God providing in miraculous ways. But if you really come down to it and say, do you believe God would do that for you? Most believers would sit just like you sat a few minutes ago and say, no, I really don't think it would happen to me. We don't think we're worthy for God to bless us in that way. That God would not ever lavishly or extravagantly pour His blessing out upon us. We just don't believe that. That we're just not sincere enough or we're not righteous enough that God would ever want to bestow His abundant blessing on me. That's our thinking. Now the truth is, Ephesians, and I hope your Bible's open to Ephesians chapter 1, Ephesians tells us that we have an inheritance in Christ. That inheritance, uh, by the way, which is one of those things you could say, I don't believe it. Because it's an amazing inheritance. You, you, you have more than a rich uncle, you've got a rich father. And, and he's left you, and, and you're in the will, Okay? Uh, he's, he's got you and one of the uh, main themes of the book of Ephesians is this inheritance that we have in Christ and the, the multitude and the magnitude of God's blessings that he gives to us because we are in Christ there's nothing we've done to earn this inheritance or to deserve this inheritance it has been bestowed upon us because of our position in Christ you didn't have to compete for it. You didn't have to enter a contest to get it. Okay? I read, a, I read this week about a newspaper owner who had three sons, and he wanted to have a contest to see which of his sons he would give the newspaper to. And the contest was to come up with the most sensational headline, but they could only use three words. And whoever had the best headline of three words, he'd give them the newspaper. Well, the first son's headline was, Reagan turns communist. Well, that was pretty good. The second son concocted this one, Putin becomes a Christian. Okay? But the third one, he inherited the newspaper. Because his headline didn't have three words, it only had two words. And it was, Pope elopes. <laughs> Well, I don't know what, I just thought that was funny. But um, you, <clears throat> you don't have to get a contest to get the inheritance that the Lord has for us. Amen? You don't have to compete for it. Look at Ephesians 1 for a moment, if you would, and look down to verse number 17. Here is Paul's prayer. He's praying that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, now here it is, may give you unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of His calling, and what the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of His power to usward who believe, according to the working of His mighty power. Do you know who you are? Look at me now. Do you know who you really are in Christ? Do you know who you really are in Christ? How do you see yourself? Don't answer out loud. How do you see yourself as a Christian? Do you see yourself as powerful? Do you see yourself as impotent? Do, your, do you hold your head up high because of your relationship with Jesus Christ? Are you embarrassed because of your relationship with Christ? Do you see yourself in riches 
or do you see yourself in rags? You know, the Bible says, Jesus said, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Sometimes all we emphasize is that the truth has the power to make us free. But the, 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 the truth of that verse is, is truth is true whether you believe it or not. Truth in that case as well we know to be Jesus Christ. And you're not going to know, the, listen, you're not going to be free until you know the truth. Not know about the truth, but know the truth. And, and experience the truth. You know, if you act on the basis of something that's not true, and you act on that basis long enough, you know what you believe? You believe the untruth to be true. You believe a lie long enough, it becomes true to you. And I think, I think listen, I believe the devil has taught us a lie to believe as far as our identity in Christ Jesus is. Now follow me this morning. I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about a stolen identity or, a, or identity uh, theft. That's kind of a popular thing nowadays. Everybody's worried about someone stealing uh, their identity and stealing your financial information that's out there. Had a guy steal mine once, but he sent it back to me and said he didn't want it. And uh, here in the six few, first few verses here of Ephesians, we're going to see just who we are in Christ. Listen carefully today. I think you'll get some help this morning. Number one, in Christ, I am significant. In Christ, I am significant. You know, everybody likes to be significant. We strive for some significance in life. Some people, consequently, they put a great value on possessions how many things they can accumulate, maybe power, maybe position, maybe fame. When, when you ask somebody, tell me about yourself, you'll quickly learn what they value. You'll quickly learn what's important to them. And you just think about in your own mind right now, if you met somebody, maybe it's a new neighbor, maybe it's a new person at work, maybe it's someone you never met before, and you had to begin to describe, okay, just who are you? And you had to begin to explain who you are. Think about the words you would use in how you describe yourself. Maybe what you do for a living. Maybe where they work. Maybe about your children. Maybe about your spouse. Maybe about your church. People always strive for some sort of acceptance based on their significance in life. I want you to hold your finger here in Ephesians 1 and I want you to go back to the book of Ecclesiastes. The book of Ecclesiastes. If you go back to the Old Testament, if you hit the book of Psalms, you go after that to the book of Proverbs. And right after Proverbs, you'll find that book of Ecclesiastes. In Ecclesiastes, I want you to look at chapter 2, would you please? Ecclesiastes was written by, who knows? Solomon. All right, Solomon. Wise man or not so smart guy? He was a wise man. Wisest man that, that there was. And, and God gave him great wisdom. And, and by the way, the key in Ecclesiastes, you don't, you don't get doctrine from Ecclesiastes. The key to Ecclesiastes is a phrase called under the sun. Ecclesiastes is life without God in the picture. Life from a perspective that everything is under the sun. I'm not looking above the sun. I'm not looking beyond this life right here. Okay? And this is Solomon now writing in chapter 2. And notice... He's, he's trying to find significance. And so here's what he did. Notice what he said, verse 4. I made me great works. I builded me houses. I planted me vineyards. Do you see the word I a lot? I made me gardens and orchard. And I planted trees in them of all kinds of fruits. I made me pools of water to water wherewith, therewith the wood that bringeth forth trees. I got me servants and maidens and had servants born in my house. Also, I had great possessions of great and small cattle above all that were in Jerusalem before me. I gathered me also silver and gold 
and the peculiar treasure of kings and of the provinces. I get me men singers and women singers and the delights of the sons of men as musical instruments and that of all sorts. So I was great, significant, increased more than all that were before me in Jerusalem. Also my wisdom remained with me and whatsoever mine eyes desired, I kept not from them. I withheld not my heart from any joy. For my heart rejoiced in all my labor, and this was my portion of all my labor. Then I looked on all the works that my hands had wrought, and on the labor that I had labored to do, and behold, all was vanity and vexation of spirit, and there was no profit under the sun. That I, I did all of the things that... that uh, people look at uh, some of those things you read that he did that's what people live for that's what they think is the, life's all about getting this and getting that and owning this and owning that and having people work for me and having people under me and I mean all the things that we look at and say now I'm a significant person you know what he said it's all vanity you know what vanity means nothing it's all nothing it's all emptiness it doesn't amount to anything it didn't bring any happiness to Solomon. And it won't bring any happiness to you. It won't give you significance. In fact, go to the end of Ecclesiastes. He sums up the whole thing after that, a whole book full of things like this, trying to find significance under the sun. Man will never find significance under the sun. Only above the sun. And, and, and only above the S-U-N, and only in the S-O-N. Amen? Uh, that's the only place you're going to find it. So he says in the last two verses of Ecclesiastes 12, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Well, here's what it should be. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. He says, you know what you better do? You better fear God and keep His commandments because we're going to stand before God one day and give an account. And all the things that we've done, as we know from 1 Corinthians 3, if, if uh, you know what all those things are, they're wood, hay, and stubble. And they'll burn up and there'll be nothing in the sight of God. And so, going back to Ephesians chapter 1, I want you to notice something, how Paul addresses the people that he writes this letter to. Paul, verse 1 of Ephesians 1, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God to the saints which are at Ephesus, the church here in Ephesus. Did you notice he addresses the believers as saints? That's interesting. Christians are commonly referred to as saints. 63 times in the New Testament. We are referred to as saints. If I would have asked you the question, and I asked several people this question this week, I said, if you would, if I ask him, I said, in your knowledge of the New Testament, which would you say, how would you say believers were referred to the most? As saints or as sinners saved by grace? And I had, I had some good, good folks, and some of you right now, if you had to pose that question, you'd probably say, sinners saved by grace. It's not even close. Maybe two times for sure, maybe three times. You, you, by the word, that phrase, sinner saved by grace, isn't there. But it's something like that, like uh, saved sinners of whom I am chief. Something like that. But only really about three times compared to 63 times we're called saints. Do you understand? The, the, what's your identity? How do you identify yourself? It doesn't mean that, that there's not an occasion of time we remind ourselves, as Paul did, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, whom I'm chief. That's all right. But I ought to dwell, let's see, three times compared to 63 times. I ought to compare, uh, what, 20 times more? <laughs> On the fact that I'm a saint of God. Saint, and, and understand, we have to understand the word saint. All right? To be a saint doesn't mean that... Um, you know, you're, you're dead and they put your picture in a stained glass window on the wall all right, or in the, in the window pane. That, that's not a saint in the New Testament sense of the word. A saint, the word means holy. It means uh, one who's simply set apart for God. That's a saint. Uh, when you received Christ as your Savior, you became a saint. Okay? 
You didn't know that, did you? St. Saint, Saint Bob. Okay? St. Pete. Oh, there is a St. Pete in there. Yeah, that's there. Huh? St. Joe. You see, there's, and, that's, and that's, that's legitimate. We, we kind of chuckle at that because we're, we're, we're uncomfortable with that, but that is biblical. And all it means is you're set apart. You're holy. Now think about what it does to your mentality. Where does it set the bar of holiness in my life? If, if I'm a saint and I'm holy, I'm set apart for God, I, I've, been, I've been chosen by Him to be blameless and holy in His sight, and if my mindset is to be a saint, or if my mindset is... I'm just a sinner, saved by grace. I'm just a sinner, saved by grace. Where's my bar? If that's all I'm thinking all the time, where's my bar, where's my standard of, of holiness going to be? Pretty low, isn't it? Because I'm just a sinner anyway. Hmm? But if my mindset and my constant thought is, I am a saint of God, I am set apart for Him, I am holy unto Him, I belong to Him, where does that put my bar of holiness? That raises it. See? And so my identity is vital in my living for God. And in my outlook and how I live for the Lord. That's, that's my, hey, that's my significance. My significance is not in what I do. Most people, that's their significance. When someone, you meet somebody, you explain who you are, you talk about what you do. Because that's where we find our significance. But our significance is whose we are and where we are in Christ. Most people, when, when we have that, 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 that down and that, that, that negative feeling, listen, it's because we're not realizing who we are. Who we are in Christ. That's my identity. That's who I am. I'm a child of the King, as she sang about this morning. We, we, we miss that. And we forget that. All believers are saints of God. And not because somebody says we are, but because of what Christ has done for us. We get, we get, we get the righteousness. We get to be part of the family of God. We get to, to, to get that sainthood because of what Jesus has done, not because of what we have done. And we get it because of what He's done for us. The Bible tells us that all of our righteousnesses are as what? Filthy rags in the sight of God. There's nothing we're going to do to be able to uh, get righteous or be able to earn enough uh, brownie points, so to speak, with God. We only get the righteousness because we get the righteousness of Christ. And hold your finger there in Ephesians and go back just, just a couple books to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Would you look there, please? 2 Corinthians 5. We'll come back to Ephesians, but I want you to see this verse. It's the last verse of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, where, where the Bible says, For he, that's God, hath made him, that's Jesus. Okay? For God hath made... Look at verse 20. We'll start there. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. For he, that's God, hath made him, that's Christ, to be sin for us. When Christ, that's him, he knew no sin. He's the only one that was ever sinless. But he made him to be sin for us. What? He took our sin on him. Why? That we might be made the righteous of God. What's the last two words? In him. In him's the key, the key there. <clears throat> we get the righteousness of God in Christ. When he died on the cross, all my sin and my wickedness and my filth was placed on Christ. And he died for me. And when I put my faith in Jesus, when you put your faith in Jesus as your Savior, hey, his righteousness and his perfectness is put on your account. You are, you are as righteous and as perfect as Jesus Christ in the sight of God. When he, sees, when he looks down at you, he doesn't see you. He sees Jesus. That's the truth. Because we're in Him. We're in Christ. And we're dressed in His righteousness alone. And, and that's a, hey, that's a new level of life. That's a new standard of life. When God sees me, He sees me in Christ. I'm, I'm not a sinner who is occasionally holy. I am a saint who occasionally sins. You understand? 
I'm not a sinner who occasionally is holy. I am a saint who occasionally sins. You have to realize who you are. Raise the bar of holiness. My significance is who I am in Christ. And that phrase, in Christ, is significant. 164 times the, the phrase in Christ or in the Lord or in Him is used in Paul's letters. 27 times just in the book of Ephesians. It's, it's again emphasizing who we are in Christ. And until we know who we are in Christ, we'll never live from that position. We won't live until we know the truth. And we know who we really are. And if we don't know who we are, we won't live out the truth. Notice Colossians chapter 3. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Two books after where we are right now. Just turn over to, to the book of Colossians chapter 3. Notice verse number 1 with me. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. My position is I'm hidden with Christ in God. Ephesians will tell me later, I'm seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Again, in Christ. That's my position. I'm only a saint because I'm in Christ. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. The only way, listen, there's only two kinds of people in the world. Those that are in Christ and those that are out of Christ. And if you're without Christ, you're without hope. You're without eternal life. You're of all men most miserable. But in Christ, you have everything. We have, you know, our significance then does not come from possessions or power or positions. You've heard it been said that some people can't get saved because they won't accept that they're sinners. And listen, some Christians don't walk in victory because they won't accept the fact that they're saints. Just as you say somebody won't admit they're a sinner in order to be saved, well, in order for you to have the victory, you have to understand what your position is in Christ now that you are saved. You're a saint of God. You are holy unto Him and set apart unto Him. In Christ we are significant. And you find it right there in First chapter of Ephesians I'm significant because I'm I, because of my standing before God in Jesus Christ he's everything I'm nothing I'm only significant because of him but I am significant because of him don't forget that I'm a saint of God now something else that Paul says here <clears throat> not only do, am I significant, he says, in Christ I'm sufficient. I'm sufficient. Notice what he said in verse 3, Ephesians 1. <laughs> this is good. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Did you notice? Look at it again now. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will bless us, who may bless us, who might bless us, who could bless us. No, what is it? Who hath blessed us. Hey, it's already happened. That's past tense. It's a done deal. You have been blessed. Now wait, you, you've been blessed. It's already taken, take, taken care of. But that's not all. Look what it says. You have not, he hath blessed us with some spiritual blessings. No, most spiritual blessings. A few spiritual blessings. No, with all, with every, with all spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That's an amazing verse. That's an incredible promise. It's not just a promise, it's a reality. But again, if we don't know the truth, we don't live the truth. 
You have to understand that truth. You don't, you don't have to say, God, I need your blessing. God says, I gave you my blessings. I've given you all spiritual blessings. They're all there. And you have to know the truth to walk in the truth. It's a promise. And those blessings or those benefits are spiritual in two ways. That Number one, they come through the Holy Spirit of God. That's who indwells us when we get saved. And He brings those blessings. And they are spiritual, not physical. He said, I blessed you with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And he goes on to tell, and throughout chapter 1, and really you could go through the first three chapters, and you ought to sometime. Just go through the first three chapters and just write down all the spiritual blessings that God has already bestowed upon us. It's incredible. It's amazing. And it's not exhaustive. I don't know how you could begin to list them all. It would be unbelievable. But, but while never, I'll never begin to walk in those blessings and live in those blessings if I don't know those blessings. I have to know them. And I have to understand them. And it'll change the way I live. In Christ I have sufficiency because I have every spiritual blessing in Jesus Christ. And so I have sufficiency. You see, I'm learning, I'm learning to rely on the resources of Christ. Did you know that in Christ you're rich? I have, I have no idea what's in anyone's bank account in this room. But I do know if you're in Christ, you're rich. You're rich. So you believe that? Yeah, hold your finger there in Ephesians. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 8, would you please? 2 Corinthians chapter 8. I can tell some of you don't believe me. So I want you to look at what the Word of God says, all right? Hopefully you'll believe God. <clears throat> Notice 2 Corinthians 8. Look at verse number 9. 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 9. For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though He was rich, yet for your sakes He became poor, that ye through His poverty might be rich. Ye through His poverty might be rich. So the riches of Christ has already been deposited in my account. What did Paul tell the church at Philippi who sent to him as far as giving and receiving? He said, because you sent once and again to my need, my God shall supply all your need according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Those riches, when, when you, give, you give God, God deposits His riches in our account. And, and we have that available to us. It's no different than if, if someone deposited a large deposit into your checking account. If you're not aware of it, you'll go on being careful and being very cautious about every penny that comes out of your account. And making sure that there's always sufficient funds there to, to cover whatever check you write or whatever debit that you would take out of your account. Once you... You, you may see something you need or something you could really use, and you say, well, I'd like to get that, but I know I don't have the funds for that. Until you go and check the account and see what your balance is, and you look at that and say, whoa, there's got to be a mistake. Isn't that our first thought? That's our first, oh, something's wrong here. It reminded me, it reminded me in uh, 2000, was it six? Diane, when did you come to church? 2006? Uh, Paul Lamprecht had just started coming to church and, uh, through the nursing home ministry and uh, met some folks from the church who went there. And, and I got a letter in the mail one day from a truck driver. She said, well, that's who she said she was. And said, I'm a truck driver. And talked about how she had got saved and listened to the, to, the, to the radio. And she said, I know I should tithe. And she said, I don't know who to send the tithe to. So my dad recently started going to your church, so I'm sending it to you. Brother Yoder, there was $500 in there. My thought is, she's got the wrong church. Isn't that how we think? See, my first thought, my, what, my first thought wasn't really, hallelujah, praise the Lord. My thought was, she's got the wrong church, so I'm going to have to send it back to her. And then, and then I remember calling Paul Lampert up and said, Paul, you got a daughter? Yeah, is her name Diane? Yeah, Diane Stoltner. And I read the letter to him, and he cried. 
And, uh, and, and you see, but that's, that, was, that was my mindset. I said, oh, I got the wrong, wrong place. I'm going to have to send it back. Isn't that how we are? Isn't that how we are oftentimes? We think, well, God couldn't bless me. Oh, yeah, God, God blesses you. And, and he, we are sufficient in him. If, if I have the riches of Christ at my disposal, see, and I'm not talking about the bank account, I'm not talking about going withdrawing money, but I have the, I have the riches of Christ at my, as my resource, then why do I live like I'm a spiritual pauper? God's, God's, listen, write a check against God's riches and it isn't going to bounce. Write a check on God's riches, it isn't going to bounce. One way that we acknowledge God's goodness to us and His deposit into our account is by thanking Him for what He's done for us. Oftentimes, you know, it's, it's, it's sad when we, we appreciate the gift and we get more excited about the gift than we do the one who gave us the gift. That's easy sometimes to forget when you receive something, get all excited about what you received and forget about the one who gave it to you. Children can do that, can't they? Get excited about what they got and so thrilled about it and they forgot to say, oh, by the way, thanks, Mom and Dad. Thank you. Appreciate it. How often do we get excited when God answers a prayer or God... God, God uh, brings something through to us. And man, you never guess what happened. Boy, God took care of it. Man, God provided. He met the need. It was wonderful, unbelievable. And we tell everybody that, and we never tell God. We never take time to say, God, thank you. Thank you. And praise God for it. Wow. In Christ, I'm sufficient for everything he calls me to do. Everything he calls me to do. I'm spiritually wealthy beyond imagination. Beyond belief. I'm, I, listen, spiritually, I'm more wealthy than Donald Trump could ever be. And others who are even more wealthy than he. In Christ, I'm significant. In Christ, I'm sufficient. But I want you to see something else in Ephesians chapter 1. In Christ, I'm also secure. In Christ, I'm also secure. Verse number 4. According as He hath chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love, having predestinated us under the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to Himself, according to the good pleasure of His will. We're, we're chosen in Christ. And listen, He's chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world, but notice what He chose us for. He didn't choose us to be saved or lost. Okay? He said He's chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love. Understand, there's a doctrine in the Bible of election, but any election, you've got to have a vote. And you get a vote when it comes to salvation. You can say yes to Christ or you can say no to Christ. Nobody is unable to say yes or unable to say no. God is not predetermined some are going to go to heaven. He didn't go through this crowd and say, okay, I'll let you go, you don't. You go, you don't. You go, you go, you don't. God's not doing that. In fact, God said that He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God said He would that all men be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth, 1 Timothy 2.4. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. And so He's, he's desiring that we all be saved. And so he, he wants us to be able to be holy and without blame before Him in love. And you understand, I think the elect are the whosoever wills and the non-elect are the whosoever wants. I think it was what He's predestinated us, verse 5, He's predestinated us under the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to Himself. That's the predestination. God predetermined that those who will put their faith in Jesus Christ would be adopted into His family. That's the process by that which that would happen. That's how we became, as she sang this morning, a child of the King. See, I've been adopted. My name's written down. I'm heir to a mansion, a robe, and a crown. I'm a child of the King. A child of the King. With Jesus, my Savior, 
I'm a child of the king. And, and we get that blessing because of his grace. Notice it says, to the praise of the glory of his grace. We get that position, we get that standing with God. We, we're accepted in the beloved, it says, because of his grace. What's grace? Somebody says, well, it's God's riches at Christ's expense, G-R-A-C-E. And that's okay, that's good. It is God's undeserved favor to us. We sit here this morning, there's not quite, is there 7 billion people in the world? Just a little over 7 billion? I think there's, there, there's like 3.7 billion that haven't heard the gospel at all, over half the world. How come you heard it? You want to know why you heard it? The grace of God. Most of you didn't have any choice that you lived in America. Or that, or that you, you heard the gospel. That someone would tell you about Christ. Or maybe you were born into a home where your mom and dad took you to church. Some in this room were not born in a home like that. And it was, it was, they, were, they, they had many years go by their life before someone told them about Jesus. That, that would be their testimony. But it's the grace of God. 156 times the grace is mentioned in the New Testament and 102 times it's used by Paul. I think it's God's undeserved favor. I think it's God's, I like to think it's God's sufficiency for my insufficiency. The grace of God. God's ability for my inability. God, God doing what I can, cannot do. That's why Paul would say, by the grace of God, I am what I am. I'm secure. Because I'm, the Bible says here, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. That word accepted means kindly received in the beloved. I'm kindly received. God has given me what I don't deserve. He's freely bestowed on me His grace and made me part of of his family. No wonder John would write, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the children of God. Wow. God loves me. God accepts me. He's accepted me already. And the same is true for you. Do you understand? There's, there's, and this is something to, to get your head wrapped around because God... There's nothing I can do and there's nothing you can do that will make God love you more. He loves you. Unconditionally, fully, He loves you. And, and by the way, He loves the fella that sits at home this morning and curses Christians going to church or curses God. He loves that guy just as much as he loves you or me. That's, that's hard. We think, God, no, wait a minute. I get up this morning and even, even showered and put on deodorant. <laughs> Tried to dress up, look nice, carry my Bible, come to church, even, even put breath mints in my mouth. I mean, man, God's got to like me more than that guy. God loves the world. God loves each individual. And there's nothing I'm going to do to earn His love or nothing I'm going to do, by the way, to make Him love me less. I can't do anything to make Him love me more, but I can't do anything to make Him love me less than what He loves me. Do you understand that? You know why? Because I'm, I'm in Christ. I'm in Christ. I'm an heir of God and a joint heir with Jesus Christ. And He loves me. I'm accepted in the Beloved. I'm accepted in the Beloved. That's security. That's security. I'm significant. I'm, in Christ, I'm sufficient. And in Christ, I'm secure. You could say it, in Christ, we're righteous. In Christ, we're rich. And in Christ, we're received. I'm blessed with every spiritual blessing. So I want to learn to rely upon those resources. 
I'm accepted in the Beloved, and I want to rely on that relationship I have with God. I want to understand who I am. The headline said, The Mystery of the Missing Owner. It was in a special section of the Chicago Tribune on Sunday, February 6, 2005. The supplement was actually a legal notice published by the Illinois State Treasurer's Office seeking to give money away to the rightful owners. It's the contents of abandoned safe deposit boxes, forgotten bank accounts, security deposit checks, uncashed paychecks, dividend checks, etc. More than a billion dollars is owed to nearly five million people and businesses that the treasurer's offices, office could not trace. The front page of the supplement listed the names of the last known addresses of ten individuals that each were owed over $100,000. What followed were 116 pages packed tightly with names, 113,000 of them. And all of them owed more than $100 in cash. It's a shame that people were living and had some treasure that was theirs that they know nothing about, that they had no knowledge of. But that is the condition of many Christians today. Living without taking advantage, without being able to use the peace, the comfort, the strength, the wisdom, the love, the power, all the spiritual treasures that God has for you and me. We live far below our privileges. Things that the heirs of God are entitled to. What, what treasure do you have that you've never claimed from God? That He says is yours and belongs to you, but you've never claimed it. You'll never behave right until you believe right. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. As long as you believe what the devil says about you, then he's stolen your identity. Who are you? Hmm? Who are you? If you live based on what other people say about you, you won't be any better off. If you live your life based on who God says you are, hmm? then you live as a saint. You live as a child of the king. Hey, you can really look in the mirror and say, I'm somebody. Because somebody lives inside me. That's the, only, that's the only way you'll be somebody. But I am somebody. Why? Because somebody lives in me. Jesus Christ. I'm a child of God. I'm a saint of God. In Christ we have, we sing, Jesus Christ is made to me all I need, all I need. And then we go about talking about all the things we need that we don't have. In Christ I'm sufficient, in Christ I'm totally secure. No one can ever take that away. That identity, don't let it be stolen. Get the mindset that I am a saint of God. I'm a saint of God. I'm set apart for Him. I, have Christ, I am in Christ and Christ is in me. I'm accepted in the beloved. I'm seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now, I, that's going to be a reality one day, but I should live like that's a reality right now. Shouldn't I? Shouldn't you? How far we live, how far below we live of our privileges in Christ Jesus. Boy, Ephesians, great book. What a wonderful truth. Don't let Satan take your identity. Live as saints of God. Don't let anybody take that away from you. Let's pray, shall we? Father, take the truth now this morning. Thank you, Lord, for everyone's attention today. Lord, thank you for this wonderful truth in Ephesians chapter 1. Thank you, Lord, that 63 times in the New Testament you call us saints. 
trying to tell us something. Oh, may we help, our, help us in our mindset, how we view ourselves, to understand that you have blessed us with all spiritual blessings in Christ Jesus. We have been blessed. We're accepted in the Beloved by your grace. Lord, I pray that if any here this morning have never experienced the grace of God, may they understand Christ died for them. May they understand that they're in need of a Savior and that Jesus is a Savior they need. But Lord, I pray that you'd speak to the hearts of believers here this morning. They'll no longer just think of themselves as a sinner who occasionally lives holy, but as a saint of God who may occasionally sin. Oh, help us to be holy and set apart unto you. Help us to know the truth. May the truth make us free. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed, and I'll finish the prayer here in just a moment. But right now this morning, just before we have our invitation, I wonder how many here today with their heads bowed and just between you and God, how many here today would say, Pastor, I, I know that I'm in Christ. You said, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. There's a day when I knew I was a sinner and I knew I needed to be saved and I knew Jesus was the Savior and I, I called on him from my heart and I trusted him as my Savior. Pastor, I know that I'm saved this morning. Would you slip your hand up for a moment and say, Pastor, here's my hand as a testimony. I know that I'm saved. All right, you may put it down. Is there anyone here today who would say, Pastor, I'm not sure about that. I don't know for sure if I died, I'd go to heaven. I, I don't know about that I'm in Christ or not. Would you let me pray for you? No one will embarrass you. No one will go to you. I'll just pray for you. Would you slip your hand up and say, Pastor, pray for me this morning? I don't think I didn't see anybody's hand that didn't go up the first time. The message was to believers today. Do you understand your identity in Christ? I wonder how many Christians here this morning could say, Pastor, I needed that message today. God stopped at my seat and he spoke to my heart. And I need to understand and know the truth that I'm a saint of God and allow that truth to affect my behavior. I want to live as a saint of God. That's my significance. That's my value. That's my sufficiency. That's my security. I'm accepted in the beloved. I am his and he is mine. Pastor, pray for me this morning. God, God spoke to my heart today. Will you slip it up, Christian? Say, that's for me. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. That's good. You may put them down. In a moment, I'll pray, and we'll have your invitation. If you're here today, and God has spoken to your heart, the altar is open for you to use it. If, if you've never been saved, come. We'll have someone take a Bible and show you how you can receive Christ. If you're saved and never been scripturally baptized, you come and say, I need to be baptized. I want to be, obey the Lord. You're saved when you're baptized. And you believe this is where you ought to belong. You come and say, we want to belong to this church. We want to serve God here. And we'll welcome you into the fellowship of our church. Whatever it is, you just need to come and pray, Christian, and just tell God, thank you for loving me. Thank you for accepting me and the beloved. Thank you that I'm a saint of God. And ask him to help you to live the truth that you were reminded of this morning. Heavenly Father, have your way now in this invitation. Thank you for speaking to hearts today. And Lord, I pray your will will be done in these next few moments that each one will do what you're telling them to do in their heart. And I'll thank you for it. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, stand to your feet. As you stand, the pianist will play. As she plays, Brother Bob's going to sing. God has spoken to your heart. Respond to him this morning. You come. I hear the Savior sing. Thy strength right. indeed is small, child of weakness, watch and pray, find in me thine all in all. Jesus made it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he was dead white as Lord, now indeed 
I find Thy power and thine alone Can change the leper's spots And melt the heart of stone Jesus paid it all All to him I own Sin had left a crimson stain He was the white as snow For nothing good have I Whereby thy grace to claim I'll wash my garments white In the blood of Calvary's Lamb Jesus paid it all All to him I owe Sin had left a crimson stain He was it white as snow And when before the throne I stand in him complete Jesus died my soul to save My lips shall still repeat Jesus paid it all All to him I owe Sin had left a crimson stain He washed it white as snow Heavenly Father, we thank you now for this morning. Thank you, Lord, for speaking to our hearts today. Thank you for your word, the encouragement that you give to us, Lord. Thank you for loving us, for your abundant grace, that where we have your favor when we know we didn't deserve it, God. But you love us, and you've blessed us far, far beyond what we would deserve. Lord, we're so grateful, and we love you this morning. I pray, Lord, we would walk out the door knowing who we are, and whose we are, that we are saints of God, and I pray we'd live up to our name. Lord, give us a good afternoon. I pray your blessing upon the day, and that you'll bring us back this evening for the services tonight, and we'll thank you for that. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. 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 I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. Brother Bob. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by His blood. Join us with Jesus as we travel this side. For I'm a part of the family, the family of God. Amen. You're dismissed. We'll see you tonight. <laughs>